ERISIFIER is the Special Ops of Health and Welfare Employee Benefits Compliance, serving employee benefits brokers and their employer clients. We offer you peace of mind that your compliance risk is managed holistically, even when the benefits environment is ever-changing. We back our work with a quality guarantee and the assurance that our attorneys and paralegals will catch what others miss. We walk alongside you with continued compliance support to protect your business and help you succeed. Here's some of our practical, actionable guidance. Please enjoy this video from the ERISA Fire Archives. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first ERISA Fire uh, COVID-19 Town Hall. I'm going to give everybody just a second um, to get in. We have a few people um, who are just now joining us. All right. Thank you all for taking time out of your Tuesday morning here. Um, so we just wanted to say uh, thank you for being here. Uh, whatever you think of what is going on now with coronavirus and the government's response to it, there's no denying that we're in a crisis. Um, so as you know, HR folks and benefits brokers all over the country um, are scrambling to carry out some very difficult orders, um, which is especially difficult balance when the, there's competing interests and the rules are changing every day. Uh, Risk of Fire, we here at Risk of Fire wanna help. Um, so our chief Arista geek, David Lefevre, will be lending his expertise. Um, David is the founder of Arissa Fire and managing attorney of Lefevre Law PC. He's been an employee benefits attorney for 13 years. Um, he's helped struggling union pension funds through the 2008 financial crisis. He's been helping countless employers and insurance agencies with Obamacare ever since it, uh, its inception. Um, his practice focuses on assisting clients in complying with Arissa and other employee benefits laws, health, welfare, and retirement. Um, he also counsels clients on plan design, implementation, and administration of qualified and non-qualified plans. Um, recently, he has authored two treatises for Bloomberg Law on healthcare plan fiduciary responsibilities and tax as aspects of health plans. Um, he's currently contributing to Bloomberg Law's professional perspective series on coronavirus. So just before I turn it over to David, um, just a friendly reminder that we will be here every Tuesday morning um, through the month of April at 10 a.m. Central. Um, it'll be the same Zoom call-in information, and David will show you um, where you can find that each week on our website. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, David. All right. Thank you, Kendra. Um, so welcome, everybody. And again, thank you for your time. Um, we have titled this a town hall for a reason. Uh, we, we, there are plenty of webinars. Um, and like Kendra mentioned, we wanted to serve people. Um, that's why we founded this company, and that's why we continue to do what we do. That's why we staffed a compliance solutions firm that does the block and tackle plan documents and 5500s with lawyers and paralegals. It's because we want to help. Uh, and uh, we probably would do uh, better financially if we just put out fires, but we decided to get in the business of the block and tackle everyday stuff. Um, to, to try to put to prevent them before they get started. Uh, so we, we titled this a town hall because we want to be able to answer your questions um, to, to, to help to provide no holds barred legal advice to people's questions and to do it during these Tuesday webinars for free. Um, so if you have uh, friends in the HR or uh, insurance agency or brokerage or consulting spaces that, that could benefit from this, um, please let them know that it is available. Uh, and like Kendra said, we're going to do this every Tuesday morning <clears throat> through the month of April um, to kind of just connect with people, answer their questions, try to make sense of rules that are changing every day. Um, a few housekeeping items. Uh, so uh, we're using Zoom, obviously, as our, our town hall technology. Um, it, uh, a couple of things I wanted to point out here as far as housekeeping. Um, we're going to be handling questions because we do want this to be interactive. Uh, we're going to be handling questions uh, through 
uh, this mechanism. So if you click on the participants tab or button in, in Zoom, um, you have the ability to hover over your own name and, and name yourself. So if, if when you logged in, it used some sort of handle that, that is not necessarily your name, go ahead and take the opportunity to, to rename yourself. And the reason is because we're going to be using this little button here on the participants uh, tab that says raise hand. Um, so if you have a question, uh, whether it's related to the prepared remarks or not, um, just raise your hand and uh, Kendra will uh, will pause every once in a while and allow people to ask questions. And so she will unmute you uh, to, uh, you know, to call on you essentially. Uh, and that's how we're going to be dealing with the questions. We're trying to make this as interactive as possible while dealing with the technological reality um, that uh, uh, mute sound and feedback is, is a very real issue, as I'm sure some of you have experienced as your companies very, very rapidly went to remote work. After the webinar, um, we're going to be putting together some materials to, to collect kind of the, the best questions that were asked or the most asked questions. Um, and so the URL for the, the, our help site is help.arisafire.com. Um, if you're looking for uh, our hyper-customized compliance calendar or signing in to work on a plan document or 5500 with us or you know, ACA penalty defense or whatever the case may be. If you're looking for that part of our site, you can actually get to it from our help site by clicking in the little thingy in the upper right-hand corner where it says go to a risk fire. Uh, we have created a special part of our help site, a library, if you will, uh, that is titled COVID-19. It is at the very top of the list. If you click on that, it will take you to uh, any articles that we've produced on this right now, because this is focused on the town hall webinar. Uh, the only article there is the details on how to get there. So if you click on that link, actually, it'll, it'll give you the site with all the details um, to tell other people about this. Uh, after the webinar, uh, if, if you have further questions or would like assistance with something, um, you can use this same site, help.arisafire.com. In the lower right-hand corner, there is a messenger. And if you click on that little blue guy, what will happen is it'll, it'll pop up with, with our, uh, our in-app messenger. It is our team of attorneys and paralegals on the other end. Uh, and so just click new conversation and uh, you, know, you can ask us your question. Or if you need help with something, uh, you can start a conversation with us there. And like I said, this is, it is our team on the other end uh, answering and fielding those questions. All right. Cool. So I have just a few prepared remarks, uh, and, and I'll, I'll go over some things that, that have become hot topics lately. Uh, and then as, uh, as you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand and we will cover those. Uh, I, I want to make sure that, that everybody's able to ask the questions that they want to ask and get the answers that they're looking for, at least as close to it with the information that we have uh, as things seem to be changing daily. Uh, so. Uh, the, the topics that I, that I have just jotted down very quickly are things like furlough and what to do about that. Uh, what does it look like? What are the benefits implications? HIPAA, does it apply? How does it apply? What do we do about it? Uh, you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act and testing. Uh, can you randomly test your employees for a fever? That's a, uh, a question that we encountered. Uh, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, looks like I'm mixing a V there. Uh, Coronavirus Response Act. We have, there's a testing coverage mandate. What does that mean? Uh, and then these, these paid leave requirements that uh, your finance folks are probably very, very concerned about. Uh, so those are just, that's just a short list of topics. Uh, I, so that I can kind of see what else is going on, uh, I'm going to exit out of uh, the presentation and the prepared remarks. Um, and there we go. That way I can see who all is, uh, uh, who is in the room. And Kendra, if at any time somebody's got a question, uh, feel free to pop in and, and call on them. Uh, the first prepared remarks I had were on kind of a practical issue of furlough. Um, it's, a, it's a term that's been, been kicked around uh, by a lot of different people. And uh, so let me just say this about furlough. Um, in benefits, in compliance, in risk management, and in, in insurance contracts, the word furlough has no meaning whatsoever, zero. Uh, furlough is uh, more of a, a, a popular term or a pedestrian everyday term. It does not have implications in the benefits world. Uh, and, and I point that out here at the outset because 
the economic realities of what's happening are going to set in. They have, uh, particularly here in Texas, because of some things that have happened with OPEC, but the economic uh, situation is, is uh, just as dire as the, the public health uh, crisis. So uh, a lot of people are talking about furloughs and what that means uh, across the nation. Because our compliance services firm has clients from coast to coast, um, we've been able to interact with a lot of people. And, and I, what I've learned is that people use the word furlough in many, many different ways. Uh, so in the benefits world, what's really important for UHR folks and for uh, insurance agencies and consultants that are working with HR folks, when somebody uses the term furlough, have them define it. And in, in fact, try to avoid it. Uh, if you can, but but you're not really going to be able to. People are going to use it, use it. Just make sure that that you've identified with that particular client because it'll change from client to client what they mean by furlough. And there are a couple of dimensions you got to keep in mind. Number one, is there a termination of employment? Uh, this was really interesting for us. In one day, we handled questions for two different agencies in different parts of the country. One agency meant furlough as a essentially what is a short term layoff where there is a termination of employment, but the word furlough is used to communicate to the employees that uh, there is an expectation that they would be rehired in some short order. A different agency in a different part of the country asked virtually the same question, used the word furlough, but there was no termination of employment. Instead, that dimension was uh, either a kind of mass company initiated leave of absence uh, or alternatively just a reduction in hours in, to, in the sense that somebody who's working 40 or 30 hours a week is now working zero, no termination of employment, but their hours have been reduced. The implications for benefits and for risk management on the HR side of things in general uh, uh, are very, very different between those two things. But because the word furlough is used, uh, we, you know, there, there is, potentially risk to an agency if they, they misunderstand the client's intentions or just because the word is used the same way twice, uh, there's not clear communication. So rule number one, ask, uh, it, you know, if a finance person is asking you uh, to you know, examine the implications of furlough, number one question back to the finance person is, are we terminating employment or not? To which the finance person is probably going to reply, well, you tell me, right? Okay, so here, here are some things to think about uh, in terms of whether or not a furlough should include a termination of employment or not. Uh, if you have a termination of, of employment, COBRA will apply. If you do not have a termination or state continuation if you're under, if you're, uh, under 20. Uh, <clears throat> the, if you do not have a termination of employment, COBRA or state continuation may not apply or won't apply necessarily. Uh, it may if your benefit plan documents uh, have an hours requirement and somebody drops below that hours requirement, uh, that could uh, result in COBRA being, uh, being triggered. Uh, but you have to look at your plan documents very carefully and examine your, your, uh, your or your client's HR policies as far as reduction in hours go. Uh, reduction in hours is common amongst companies that have hourly workforces, but in salaried, mostly full-time workforces, a reduction in hours is an unfamiliar term. Uh, so examine whether or not your furlough with no termination of employment is going to be a leave of absence and handled under those HR policies or a reduction in hours and handled under different policies, which may or may not trigger state continuation of benefits. Similarly, on the retirement plan side, is there a separation from service? Is there a break in service for purposes of uh, your vesting accruals? Uh, it gets very, very complicated very quickly. And so, but, but the starting point is, is there a termination of employment? If not, is it a reduction in hours or is it a, a, a company imposed leave of absence? For those in the insurance industry uh, who are handling you know, life insurance policies, disability policies, et cetera, uh, keep in mind your actively at work provisions. Uh, insurance carriers and policy or insurance policies contain a lot of times an actively at work provision uh, and mark my words, the, the economic situation here is such that, uh, you know, be it principal or Lincoln Financial or whoever the case may be, uh, there will be pressure on insurance companies uh, to be, perhaps be a little more strict in <clears throat> uh, paying out disability or life insurance claims. So 
and I, I don't, I, I hate to be morbid, um, but it is entirely possible that some of your employees or their spouses uh, might not survive. The percentages are, are, are low. Um, the, the percentages of the mortality rate coming out of Wuhan, China uh, is, is 1.4%, uh, which is not enormous, but when, you, when you're talking about 40 to 70% of the entire world um, catching the virus, 1.4% will be quite a few people. Um, and so uh, when deciding whether or not, so bringing it back to the benefits compliance aspects, um, when deciding whether or not you're going to go with a termination of employment or reduction in hours or um, a uh, uh, leave of absence, be mindful of the, the life insurance policy implications and the disability insurance uh, implications uh, as far as those actively at work provisions, uh, because there, there will be financial pressure on insurance companies over time um, to, uh, to to keep their losses uh, manageable. Uh, all right, so, so on the furlough question, or really, you know, if there are other questions, I certainly don't want to be talking for the next uh, 45 minutes. Um, so uh, does anybody have any questions along those lines or something else that they, they wanted to raise? Um, so if you go to, uh, I believe it's participants, yes, participants, and you can click raise your hand uh, to, uh, ask a question and we will unmute you. Nobody wants to be brave. I'm scrolling through the list. No worries. That's all right. Please do along do the way. Have one. Oh, go ahead. Uh, if life and disability coverage is ending for the employee, what responsibilities do the employer have to provide conversion information? Oh man, what a great question. So uh, this is an issue that uh, is very, very real. Uh, there is litigation on, uh, on this issue, I'd say probably six or eight times a year that make it into the national reporters, meaning that there's an appellate court decision for every appellate court decision, you've got a hundred or a thousand more uh, trial court cases ongoing about this, but it is an indication of the volume of litigation on this issue. So um, whether or not there is liability for failure of an employer to advise someone on conversion rights or portability rights, in, in ERISA, they're handled largely the same way. Uh, so whether it's conversion or portability, uh, the, the liability of the employer uh, generally turns on a fact-based inquiry. And if you talk to your general counsels, your outside counsels and other risk managers about fact-based inquiries, uh, generally speaking, that stinks for the employer because fact-based inquiries require discovery and discovery in, in litigation is extraordinarily expensive. So in general, you want to avoid fact-based uh, fact uh, inquiries, but that, that is what, what it turns on. And the facts that generally uh, will support a claim that a, an employer breached its fiduciary duties by failing to advise a portability or conversion turn on things like what did the HR person or what did uh, the insurance agent, if they were fielding the question, say about the benefit? Uh, pretty much across the board, there, the, when, when an employer uh, or an insurance agency just trying to help makes a sort of representation of sorts that, the, that there will be coverage or yes, of course, we'll help, you know, the, the, you, we'll file your, claim, your life insurance claim. Of course, uh, you know, you're going to be covered here. Uh, it, it's uh, th those facts essentially uh, turn into a, a verbal, albeit contractual promise that there will be a benefit that may or may not be covered by the insurance policy. Uh, the, the particularly tricky areas are miscommunication or failure to communicate the timelines for giving notice to the insurer of portability or conversion rights. Uh, oftentimes, it, it, the, the you know, it might be a certain number of days for LFG, but a different number of days for principal and, and, you know, it's just, 
you're in the middle of a renewal and you're switching carriers and forget, oh, nuts, it's, 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 it's 30 days instead of 60 or 60 instead of 90. And as a result, uh, the, that is a, a misrepresentation that is actionable under ERISA, or at least arguably actionable under ERISA as a breach of fiduciary duties. Uh, there are some cases out there where the employer was, was held uh, not liable for failing to communicate that. Uh, generally speaking, the employers who are able to, uh, to avoid responsibility or liability in those lawsuits uh, involve employers that have very well-defined plan documents, very well-defined notices, a very good procedure for delivering notices. Uh, largely, that means electronic distribution, uh, and we can get into how you do that if, if folks want to talk about it. Um, but but the, the, the employers who are prepared are the ones who generally will, will, will not be liable for uh, failing to communicate conversion and portability uh, uh, options that are available under life insurance and, and other policies. So uh, similarly, if an insurance agency is involved in that process, it can be a source of an E&O claim. Um, for, because if the insurance agency, just because it wants to help, right, uh, has gotten into the mix of, of helping employees with claims, uh, you know, not being very cognizant and very forward with employees about their rights and for to convert uh, can also make the, the agency liable for uh, an error or omission. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an area of ongoing litigation. It is real. Uh, and just, just to give you some perspective on what the real risk is here, uh, when an employer, uh, you know, be it a, a very well-meaning HR person who's just trying to help a, a person whose spouse just died, right? Uh, when uh, when there's this, you know, yeah, yes, I can help you. Yes, we'll get your claim taken care of. Uh, I'm 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 sure we'll get it paid for. Or whatever whatever promise is 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 made, uh, you know, kind of just in the in the emotion of the moment. That is a representation of a benefit. That is a promise to an employee from the employer, and it is quasi-contractual in nature. If the insurance policy that backs up that promise does not actually provide the benefit, and it could be for a hyper-technical reason or it could be for a very obvious reason, it doesn't matter. If the insurance policy does not pay on the benefit, the employer is stuck self-insuring. And this, this point is lost on a lot of people because when you purchase your life insurance or your disability insurance, and you're not self-insuring these things, your assumption is that, well, whatever the policy is, is what the person gets. Why am I on the hook for it? But as soon as you make a promise, be it in an open enrollment guide or, you know, in the emotion of helping an employee whose spouse just died or helping a spouse who, uh, of an employee, uh, of an employee who died, uh, those promises are, are still under the law of valid promises that can be enforced, even though the insurance policy is not there to provide the benefit. So you're left holding uh, an, an empty promise that now you have to essentially self-insure. In our shop, we call it accidental self-insurance. Um, and without very well pro drafted uh, plan documents, uh, formal ERISA plan documents that are often called a, a wrap document of sorts, without very well drafted documents, um, you can wind up accidentally self-insuring quite a few things. Uh, and in general, um, th th this is worth mentioning, um, because this is a crisis situation and things move very, very quickly, and, and this, this is for both insurance agencies and employers alike, it is extraordinarily important to pause, take a breath, and just take a moment before responding. The the natural tendency of a lot of people who are in HR and are there because they want to help people, right? That's, that's why we become HR professionals. The tendency can be to, for the, the desire to help um, to be very, very strong and respond to that. And it's kind of only after the fact that we realize you know, oh, I, you know, this, this insurance policy may, for a hyper-technical reason, not actually provide what it is that we're, 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 we're saying. Like, we want to help people, but there may not be the insurance policy to back it up. Uh, and so, you know, the, the same is true of insurance agencies and in giving advice um, or just helping people through all the, 
the understanding of these, these ever-changing rules. Uh, I, I haven't looked at the news in the last hour or so, but I understand we're, you know, we're looking at a $2 trillion package uh, to, to assist everything from small business to, to you know, Fortune 50 companies. Uh, and the details are changing very, very rapidly. The Families First Coronavirus Response Act is, is also similarly changing very rapidly. Um, and so uh, it's important to just, just pause. And if, if, if you don't know the answer, it's okay. Uh, I'll get back to you. It's okay to say that. So um, I'm going to pause here for a second. And uh, it looks like we've got some follow-up questions. And let's see. Tom, I'm going to let you ask your follow-up question. Can you hear me right now? Yes, we can. You're on oh, the air. Okay, great. I have a big fit right Hey, David, it's Tom Self. I really appreciate the town hall. Thanks a lot. Um, so I have, I'm have. i getting some questions, and maybe the answers are there if I dig, dug deeper, but maybe you might know. Um, one example of a question I'm getting is, um, let's say we've got a client who's sending people home, and there's a lot less work to do, for example. Um, so they're they're working, but very light duty or very, you know, barely working. And let's say one of those employees has um, a child who's 16 or something like that, who for all practical purposes can stay home by themselves. They're asked, and this is a probably a question for their attorney, not their insurance advisor, obviously, but what, what how would you answer that if they said, you know, is, could we pay them this um, emergency paid sick leave because their kid's high school was canceled? Um, is that, is that sketchy? Is that against the rules? Is there an age threshold that you're aware of? Or is there any sort of good faith sort of um, standards that we have to be mindful of? Gotcha. Okay. So if I understand the question, um, you're asking whether there are any guidelines or rules about uh, an employer who wants to, and this is where I need to clarification, who wants to provide a stipend of some sort, right? Yeah. So they're looking at the rules for the, the new emergency paid sick leave and one of the um, one of the criteria can be if you're if the school is closed or care or daycare provider but really the the child we're talking about doesn't need supervision <laughs> um, is it they're, they're feeling uneasy about whether they should be uh, if they can use that money and then get, collect that tax credit for that um, short-term pay um, for that purpose when really kind of what's happening is maybe they should be filing for unemployment in, in regular circumstances. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Uh, so yeah, let me, I'm, gonna, I'm pulling up the law now. Uh, so there's, there are two aspects of this. Um, one is the, the mandate that employers under 500 uh, employees provide uh, leave for in the event of a, a closure of a school or, or having to care for a child. And uh, let's see, my recollection, I have not seen, well, it's, it's a cross-reference definition. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't followed the rabbit hole all the way. Um, and that's fine if you haven't either, but I, I have not seen any summaries or any reference to there being an age of the child um, at, at all. And I, and I'm stum I'm struggling to know what to tell clients. So just, I don't know, is probably the answer right now. So, yeah. So the, all we have from the regulatory agencies at this point, and no, I just, I just scanned the, the law and there's no, there's actually not even a cross reference to a definition of child, except for uh, uh, the, the, the part of the law that had to do with school lunches. Uh, and, uh, and food assistance. So uh, what I do know is the, the regulations have not been issued. All we have is a press release from DOL and IRS at this point. Um, and they're expecting eight regulations out at the beginning of April. Um, so if we're, if we're talking about, first of all, an employer that is under 500 and subject to the law, um, there are, uh, the, this law was incorporated into others. So those other laws can be helpful. And give me just one second. I have a I have my cheat sheet here uh, because the much like the ACA, 
this Families First Coronavirus Response Act was copied and pasted. It, it is its own bill in the sense that that's what passed through Congress, but the bill has the effect of tacking things onto other laws. And so, give me just one second. Uh, all right, so the paid leave, that's right, okay, so the paid leave requirement was added to both or to, to different parts of it were added to the Family Medical Leave Act. And another part of it was add, added to the Fair Labor Standards Act. So the family leave requirement that uh, expands it to like 12 weeks, right? And, and expands the reasons why that was copied and pasted into the Family Medical Leave Act. Meaning Tom, and I'm, I'm stepping out on a limb a little bit here until we have regulations. Uh, my, if, if an employer asked me today for the legal advice of what, you know, what does this mean today? My advice would be uh, that you, you incorporate whatever the FMLA says about, you know, a, caring for a child. Um, and so, you know, if it, if it would qualify for FMLA leave based on the child's age, then it'll qualify for this. Um, my, my, you know, this fairly, the, uh, the Family Medical Leave Act is administered by DOL, not by Treasury. And so th this, is, this is an important distinction that, that has to leave the answer with we don't know right now, because on the one hand, DOL and the FMLA mandates this leave for employers under 500. Separately, Treasury is creating a tax credit for it. We hope they talk together about the regulations. Uh, but if, if you, you know, which, which was common under the ACA for HHS, to DOL, and Treasury to all get together on these regulations, that takes time to do that kind of collaboration. Um, and I'm not entirely confident that we have the time uh, for the agencies to, to really collaborate. So it may be that at the end of the day, we get guidance from agencies that's not perfectly congruent. So think of Venn diagrams, right? Um, that overlap, but are not congruent. Uh, and it is conceivably possible that the, that the tax credit to pay for this is slightly different than the actual paid leave mandate. Uh, so that is possible. And I wanna make sure that we're, we're, we understand that. Those are two totally different things. Our hope, uh, certainly everybody's hope, is that uh, folks, <coughs> Uh, is that folks, uh, that, that it will be the same. Um, so Tom, in answer to your question, I, I, you know, I, if it qualifies for FMLA leave, uh, uh, if it qualifies for FMLA leave, it's, it's going to, uh, it's probably gonna qualify for this. And thank you, Christy. All right, yeah. So uh, one of our paralegals, Christy Vanderwater, uh, just pulled up the definition in it, uh, from FMLA and it is under 18. Um, so in your example, Tom, a 16-year-old uh, would qualify for the leave, like needing to care for a 16-year-old would qualify for the leave. So we have a few folks with questions. All right. Um, next up is uh, Bradley Vicaro. Thanks, Kendra. Thanks, David. Um, I wanted to uh, shift gears a little bit. Uh, and focus on benefits. I think uh, employees, uh, sorry, employers are starting to think about ways to get creative um, with staff that is out on, you know, again, we'll call it furlough. So we'll say on unpaid uh, leave approved by the employer without termination, uh, where employers are starting to think about uh, can we continue maybe medical benefits, uh, but then think about drafting perhaps some quick policies to uh, say that employees in such situations might now not be uh, eligible for, let's say, FSA and commuter plans or dental and vision, right? No one's going to a, a dentist or an optometrist right now. So, uh, you know, thinking about not uh, potentially terminating the plans themselves, but adhering to, uh, let's say, a 30-hour work week eligibility rule for uh, those less essential benefits um, while being flexible, um, perhaps on the medical plan. Gotcha. And so uh, if I understand kind of the factual scenario, uh, so uh, just for everybody else's benefit, uh, Brad is coming to us from, from California, uh, which has had a little bit different experience in some other parts of the country. Um, and uh, so, 
the, if I understand the question, uh, we've got an employer who are we, are we saying essentially is is kind of pausing operations entirely, or are we talking about a segment of the workforce and expecting to bring them back? What kind of time frame are we talking about? Yeah, I think we're talking about uh, probably you know let's say uh, a segment of the workforce uh, you know and just for an example we'll use a, a white collar business uh, you know where there are uh, probably some layoffs. Uh, another portion is dropping down to 25% time or even 0% and then maybe there's a core team uh, that is still working uh, but for the most part uh, so the plans are still in place there are still active employees um, but wanting to and expecting to bring those uh, workers who are reduced hours, uh, hoping to bring them back to full time at some point, but not knowing if it's going to be three weeks or three months at this point makes it yeah. uh, a challenge. Right. Yeah. So they're looking ways to to cut costs both for themselves and for the uh, for the employees that are sharing yeah. the cost yeah. potentially okay. by the benefits. All right. Yeah. And so, so the, the, the question is a matter of creativity, right? So what can, you know, can, can the employer provide uh, essential benefits, right? Things that it deems essential kind of in the vein of uh, allowing essential businesses to continue during a, uh, a stay in place or a stay at home order. Uh, you know, can, can we, can we pick and choose? So th this is very representative of the kinds of issues we are going to confront. Um, because the legal answer and the practical answer may be two totally different things. The technical answer is that, uh, you know, you start with, is there a termination of employment? If there is, then, then COBRA is going to apply. If it's a reduction in hours that results in, in a loss of eligibility under the plan, which is a plan document issue, you know, COBRA or state continuation may apply. If there's not a termination, and so this may be different segments of the employer, right? Some segments that are laid off, you've clearly got, you know, COBRA or state continuation. Uh, if they're not laid off, but their hours are reduced, uh, you know, what does that look like? And so do, we have, do the plan documents provide that, it, that you do have a loss of eligibility? Um, is the carrier in an insured case going to care uh, about the, the difference between active or COBRA coverage? That's a good question, right? Uh, but then you got people who are, uh, you know, who, who just who may not be working and uh, you might want to continue in, uh, medical benefits, but not some of the others. So uh, if COBRA or state continuation applies, it's going to apply to all the benefits that normally apply, including in health FSA. Um, commuter doesn't apply, COBRA doesn't apply to commuter. Um, so you basically have to look at each law and figure out how each one would work. Uh, to accomplish the task, legally speaking, of kind of picking and choosing, you're effectively going to have to terminate the plan on a short-term basis. Uh, which sounds like a lot of legal gyration to get the result you want. Uh, and so at the end of the day, if the employer looks at all its options and says, look, I've got viability in my business on the line. And at the same time, I want to care for people. Uh, and and this, is, this is a balance, by the way, uh, of serving without sacrificing the enterprise uh, that is very real for a lot of people, uh, especially small business owners. And uh, you know, so you've, you've, you're faced with a situation where you want to kind of like help people with the basics. Um, and it, you may wind up in a position where the lawyer's advice is not what you want to follow. Uh, and in this situation, the technical answer may be that you have to continue all these benefits. You're supposed to do this, that, and the other thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, if the downside risk is viability of your or, you know, loss of your business and thus loss of that person's job entirely, right? Um, it, it may be, and in some cases I, I submit, it is very reasonable uh, to make the business risk decision. This is what we're going to do. We believe it's the right thing. If I'm going to take my lumps, if it's not the technically correct and, and, and compliant thing to do, that is a perfectly rational business risk decision to make, uh, especially when you throw into the mix the, 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 the fact that the Family First Coronavirus Response Act bolted on to both the Fair Labor Standards Act and the and FMLA. So you have obligations to continue, actually quite a few benefits. You have an obligation, if you're under 500 anyway, to provide paid leave. So that has implications about whether or not you want to have your furlough be a termination of employment or your furlough be 
uh, be a uh, you know, kind of company imposed leave or reduction in hours. If there's not a termination of employment, this law will apply and you have to provide paid leave potentially for upwards of 12 weeks, right? So, the, so that, that factors into the decision. Um, and at the end, it, it, yeah, so anyway, I, I hope that answers the, the question in the sense that there is a technical answer, but there might be a practical answer that is different than the legal one. Um, yeah, Brad, does that, Thank you. does that address it? It does, thank you. So uh, David, we have a clarifying question. I think you answered this, but I um, just wanted to confirm if they're hearing correctly that with respect to FIMLA, the new bill applies to all companies, even over 500. State the question again. Am I hearing correctly that with respect to FIMLA, the new bill applies to all companies, even over 500? Ah, thank you for clarifying that. No. So the, the, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act paid leave requirements, uh, the, the expansion of FMLA and this kind of bolt on to FLSA, uh, only applies to employers uh, with fewer than 500. So 500 is, is the, the point at which uh, you, it no longer applies. Uh, so. You ready for the next question? Uh, give me just one second here. Um, Christy uh, pulled up some details on the 500 employee count. And this was something I, I was kind of concerned about, like, how do we count this? Um, and, and this is very typical of very quickly drafted legislation. Um, I was noticing this morning that, uh, you know, the, remember the FMLA applies to employers uh, with over 50 in 20 or more work weeks in the calendar year prior. Congress could have in, you know, inserted or substituted only the word 50 with the word 500 and left the rest of the test, the 20 work week uh, test. It didn't. So Congress replaced the entirety of 50 employees in each of the 20 work weeks prior, blah, 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 that entire thing with 500 employees. So it removed the test for how you determine whether or not there are 500 employees. Uh, and which complicates matters, right? Because we now have not a whole lot of, heck of a lot of clarity. Um, I will say this, that uh, the, with respect to the FMLA, uh, there is what's called an integrated employer test. And I anticipate that DOL will use that very same test for this 500 employer requirement, meaning that if you're in a controlled group under 414 of the code, you can pool all those together uh, for purposes of this 500 limit. What's interesting is that normally the government wants to uh, pool employers together for purposes of getting that number up so it grabs more employers and makes the rule applicable to more employers. In this case, it's the reverse, right? So uh, it, you know, there might be an incentive on the agency's part uh, to may, perhaps have different rules uh, because it wants more employers subject to it. It, it, it. That's a long shot. Uh, but as it stands right now without regulations, FMLA does have an integrated employer test. So you're looking at a controlled group basis. Uh, FMLA's integrated employer test is broader than the controlled group rules. It's not just 80% uh, ownership, give or take, with a whole bunch of complicated rules. Uh, it's actually much, much broader. Uh, not exactly the same, but similar to the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, joint employer test. It's, it's not as broad as that, uh, but, uh, but it is broader than the control group rules. So again, the, the, the new legislation that was passed uh, for, for paid leave is only for companies that are under 500 employees. So good question. Glad you clarified that. Next question from Tara Spates. If we furlough everyone and shut the company down for a couple months, possibly three months due to this pandemic, do we have to pay them right now for their PTO and vacation? Will they be able to file for unemployment? Gotcha. So uh, question number one, um, you know, is there a termination of employment? I am assuming based on the facts, Tara, that, uh, that this is a shutdown of the company uh, and there is an actual termination of employment. Uh, assuming that's the case, then whether or not accrued PTO has to be paid out is entirely determined by uh, the, the, the HR policies that are in existence. So what does the PTO policy say about cashing out those benefits? 
and, and just kind of in general, when it comes to those kinds of issues, uh, different areas of the country have different uh, judicial leanings, but generally speaking, kind of if you're on the coasts, uh, it, you're guilty until proven innocent. So if your policy says nothing about cash out, you, you stand a decent chance if somebody's going to sue over it or raise a complaint um, that you might have to cash them out. Some states do have laws about that, by the way. Uh, so this, this, is, this answer is subject to, to state law differences. Uh, but, you know, you know, other states are different in that respect. And, uh, you know, Texas, for instance, is a very employer-friendly state. Um, and, uh, you know, employers have a little bit more freedom if their policies are silent um, to say, no, this is not a benefit that, that you get, uh, that has to be cashed out. Uh, that said, the best thing to do is to, is to have a policy that says we do not cash out upon termination of employment. That, that's the, that's the, be the, the best course of action to the extent state law allows you to do that. Uh, there was a second half of Tara's question. Will they be able to file well, on for unemployment? Um, so that is also a state, state law issue. Um, so I'll use uh, California and Texas as examples. In California, uh, you don't have to have a termination of employment to file for unemployment insurance benefits. Um, a reduction in hours is sufficient. Uh, in other states, for instance, um, you do have to have a, a termination of employment. Uh, but again, it is state by state and a very quick Google search for your state's uh, unemployment insurance benefit eligibility. Uh, what you'll, you'll find an FAQ page from the state agency that, that will outline that fairly quickly. Um, but, uh, but in this case, we said that, uh, or I said that we're kind of assuming there will be a termination of employment. Yes, uh, they can file for unemployment. One additional issue I wanted to raise uh, that is particularly salient for employers that are considering uh, what the airlines call draconian measures. Uh, this, the, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act is not retroactive, not. It is not retroactive. It doesn't, it takes effect. My recollection is 15 days after it was passed. And in, and in my mind, April 2nd sticks as the date. Uh, I'm sure somebody uh, will be able to post here uh, if that's incorrect, but I, I believe that the effective date will be April 2nd. Once that law takes effect, there is a provision that prevents retaliation, if you will, by an employer against the exercise of the rights in that act. And it's not outside the realm of possibility. It's, it's, an, it's a non-interference uh, provision that's common. ERISA has one, the code has one. Uh, they're, 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 they're quite common in uh, the benefit space. So it is entirely possible that, particularly if you're, if you're desperate for, for, uh, to pay your bills, that the claim might be to the employer, hey, you, you terminated me you know, when this bill said this law that co Congress passed, again, under 500 employees, uh, says you're supposed to provide me paid leave. And it is possible uh, the employer could be on the hook uh, for terminating employee after April 2nd, uh, on or after April 2nd, assuming that's the effective date, uh, due to the fact that they would have to provide this paid leave benefit. Uh, you know, we, we, we lawyers are, are risk managers and we're always, we're, we're asked to divine lots of different scenarios. And this was one that I'd, I'd, I'd thought of when I was reading the law um, that, uh, you know, if you terminate somebody and they're entitled to some paid leave, uh, there, there may be some, some back wage claims uh, that, that could be made, uh, you know, theoretical at this point, but it, but it is possible, um, which is to say, tread carefully and make sure you've got a good advisor, a, a, you know, a good legal counsel when taking any of these steps uh, that we're talking about, because there are, there are far reaching implications and it's a, it's a domino effect uh, of, of uh, application of various laws. All right, who else has a question? Next question, Wanda starts. Hi, David. Hey Wanda, how are you doing? Good. So with this emergency um, paid sick leave act, is there any way that the employer would have to pay for an employee that is subject to 
the government stay at home order. They're not sick, but you know, one of the points that I'm looking at, the, the employees subject to government quarantine isolation order related to coronavirus, is there any way that they would have to pay because an employee's been told, you know, stay home? And then second part is, what does the employee have to do to request the paid leave in any instance? Gotcha. Uh, so hopefully, I'll, I'll take those kind of in reverse order. In terms of what the employee has to do, um, we, we don't have regulations on that. Uh, because this was incorporated into the, the uh, FMLA, uh, again, my guess is that the agencies are, especially under this kind of time pressure, are gonna borrow as much as they can from existing laws and, and procedures. Uh, so it would probably be very similar to just requesting FMLA for additional reasons that are not currently on the form. Uh, the, the DOL is supposed to be coming out today or tomorrow uh, I believe it was Wednesday, uh, but I, the DOL is supposed to be publishing today or tomorrow uh, a model notice to give employees. By the way, there is a notice requirement in here that employers are required to furnish uh, a notice to employees. And I found this rather ironic, given especially the question you just asked, Wanda. The law says that they're supposed to post it, right? As in like at the workplace where they are not at because they're at home. Right. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. But yes, there is a notice requirement um, and the, the DOL will have to issue regulations or at least emergency guidance to say how that takes place, how employees request it. Um, I, would, I would counsel employers to treat any reasonable request uh, as a request for this paid leave. Uh, similar to the case law that exists for requesting FMLA leave, um, it does not have to be a super formal procedure, the, the request can be made, HR has to follow up with any required forms, uh, but there are plenty of cases out there where an employee kind of informally asks for leave, the employer never does anything with it, and then they're liable for uh, a major claim that's incurred uh, because uh, you know coverage under the health plan was terminated uh, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and then your first question, uh, Wanda, what was your, the first part of your question again? So one of the first points that you see on provisions under the act says that if an employee is subject to government quarantine isolation related to coronavirus, are they eligible for the paid leave? They're not sick, but they've just been told by the county, stay home, do not go to work. Yes, yeah, so that is an independent reason for taking this new FMLA. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, so they do not need to be sick. Um, and, and that's, that's massive, right? I mean, like that's, so here in Harris County, which, which uh, includes Houston, we, we were issued a stay at home order this morning, uh, that takes effect tonight. Uh, you know, they've, they've been in place on the coasts for a while. Uh, and, uh, I saw, uh, Kansas and other, uh, Ohio for sure. They're, they're happening all over the place. Um, so in, in terms of, kind of getting your head wrapped around the magnitude of this, uh, essentially anybody that you are currently employing could be entitled to uh, paid sick time, again, under 500 employees, uh, if they are subject to a quarantine or isolation order. Um, what would be interesting, uh, what would be interesting is if the agencies define quarantine differently than a stay at home order or shelter in place. Uh, and that, that, so different, different localities are using different terms. Uh, so lockdown, shelter in place, stay at home, quarantine, different words are being used to describe these kind of even local level orders, sometimes statewide, but local level orders as well. Uh, and we're gonna need guidance from, uh, from the agencies about whether the act by local quarantine uh, means the same thing as a shelter in place or a stay at home order. Uh, quarantine, uh, yeah, that, that's, that'll be interesting. And I, I'm wondering if anybody else has any thoughts on that actually, because um, it just occurred to me that there, there might be a difference.
we can look that up and, and talk I more about I think that's it something, week. that is something, yeah, that we should, we, we'll, we'll post to our library. We'll, uh, uh, Kendra or Christy, if we could jot that down as something to come back to on the, on the library. Uh, we've got about uh, six minutes left and, I, and there, are, there are a lot of questions. So uh, Kendra, who do we have? Uh, let's be a little egalitarian Wendy, here. Who's been waiting for a while? Uh, Wendy Hoffman. What considerations do we need to think about because we are granting unpaid time off for associates who do not qualify for FEMLA as we do not want to end employment due to our extensive pre-hire background process? What do we need to think about in terms of our benefits plans? Uh, a lot. Um, so uh, so uh, the Wendy's company is over 500 employees, so this new law will not apply. Um, and so for those of you in the room here who have clients or who are a company that is over 500 employees, uh, you know, what considerations are there um, to, to grant unpaid time off? Uh, so unpaid, they're, they're not receiving a paycheck. So they're essentially just not working, right? They're not receiving, they're not getting any hours, they're not working. Uh, and so you got to go back to the, the, the existing policies that you have and break them apart and turn their, in, in, into their different components. So there's no termination of employment under this scenario. Um, FMLA does not apply uh, for, for various and sundry reasons. Let's say they've not met their hours because they've been part-time in the past and they don't meet the, the hours threshold for FM, to be eligible for FMLA, or they haven't been employed long enough to have FMLA. Uh, so as a result, uh, <clears throat> you, know, you wanna keep them on the rolls, but, but uh, you know, FMLA doesn't apply. So to the extent that you provide any other benefits to similarly situated employees, you'd look at your non-FMLA leave policies to see what happens. Uh, you know, if, if there's a benefit, you know, that's one place. Then there's the benefit plan documents themselves. So does the reduction in hours trigger a loss of eligibility under the plan? Uh, <clears throat> does the concurrent rise in hours later on, assuming that happens, trigger new eligibility under the plan? Uh, and uh, you know, discuss what you want the result to be, and then get with us. Uh, uh, we work, uh, we work with Wendy. Uh, so get with us and let us know uh, what you want the result to be, and we can kind of help massage and, and fix the, the policies where need be. Um, but uh, it, uh, the other aspect that I mentioned much earlier, uh, but that I want to make sure is restated, is to check the actively at work provisions in any insurance policies that would apply to uh, someone who uh, maybe was full-time, but is now being, uh, you know, is being given unpaid leave that is not FMLA leave. Uh, so look at those actively at work provisions to, to see whether or not those benefits are being provided. Uh, because you don't want to wind up in a situation where you tell somebody, oh yeah, we're going to continue benefits, but the insurance policy doesn't allow you to do it. Uh, accidental self-insurance. Uh, and other benefit plan considerations on the retirement plan side, uh, there are things going to be implicated like uh, credit for vesting, credit for matching contributions. Uh, so all that those service credit issues uh, are going to be uh, going to need to be thought about. Uh, uh, and because we've dealt with this a ton on the retirement plan side, so so this is to UHR folks. Uh, and the retirement beneficial, uh, benefits professionals in the room. Uh, make sure your payroll systems are recording hours properly. Do not assume that hours are or are not being passed through the, HR, the, the payroll system for uh, benefits purposes, particularly retirement. Uh, there are a lot of very ordinary corrections that we have to do for retirement plans just because the payroll system was not set up exactly like you thought it was and you don't see it until later this crisis will bring all those those implementation issues to the bear to the forefront uh, so it if you've got the time it would be worth uh, getting with the payroll vendor to make sure hours are being credited correctly or not is the match being calculated correctly for payroll periods where uh, there are no deferrals uh, it gets it's, it gets complicated quickly uh, let's take one more question. Anybody want to raise their hand or uh, pop in a question in the messenger? We have Laura McLaughlin. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute you, Laura. Or unmute you. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, Laura. Welcome to the show. 
Hey, thank you so much. Happy to be here. Um, Information is really helpful, so thank you. Uh, my question is, um, I'm a consultant and I have several small businesses that I consult with that are under 500 um, employees. And it, there's a, a clause that says uh, small businesses can be exempt with fewer than 50 employees if the required leave would jeopardize the viability of their business. I know we're new into this and that it just seems pretty nebulous to me. Um, but I want to be careful too, just to be like, ah, it would jeopardize, jeopardize our business. And I mean, what, what do you think would be a good justification to say that we wouldn't be able to do that? That's a fantastic question. And it's one that uh, I, I immediately started noodling on myself um, because, you know, yeah, I, I I know a lot of, we work with a lot of employers in various industries and uh, because the, I mean, the, the government's response is, well, hey, we're gonna pay for this. We'll pay you back. It's through a payroll tax credit. Um, I don't know, most of you have worked with payroll companies before. They don't move real fast. Right. When, when ADP ramped up to do 1095 reporting, it spent nearly a billion dollars on software. And a year later, told everybody on a national conference call, yeah, sorry, it doesn't work and we're not gonna fix it, right? So uh, the reality of the situation is that the payroll vendors aren't gonna be able to, this is through a payroll tax credit, right? Those are quarterly filings. They're gonna be due really soon. Uh, like there's no way, right? So employers are gonna to have to foot the cash flow bill until they can get the, until the software can get in the right spot we get guidance and so they're going to have to put the bill until it gets paid and that threatens a lot of businesses so what what do we what does the government mean by uh, viability uh we have no idea uh what it means by threatening the viability of the business uh, i'm i'm just guessing but it's probably going to be a very narrow uh interpretation whatever the facts are the reality of the situation is that bureaucrats and judges are going to be making these decisions and they are human uh, and clients will necessarily be prejudged. So uh, if, if a, uh, an employer is in the uh, hospitality, restaurant or retail business, I think it'll be pretty easy to, and they're under 50 employees, it'll be pretty easy to make a case that this threatens the viability of their business. I just got a text message from a friend of mine uh, with a restaurant down the street here, they've closed. Uh, and uh, this, this is happening uh, all over the country. And so if, if, you're, if you're in uh, uh, your restaurant, retail, especially small shops, uh, ultra small shops, if you're in uh, hospitality, travel, uh, those kinds of industries, um, you're, you're probably gonna be able to make a viability argument very, very quickly just by virtue of your SIC code. Uh, other businesses might have a harder time meeting that threshold. Um, you know, viability uh, is a, that, that's a nuclear consequence. And I would expect that you're going to have, probably going to have to prove it in some way uh, in terms of, you know, this is our cash flow and, and uh, it's, it's not going to survive. Uh, now, that being said, it, using what I just mentioned about this cash flow issue, it's not a matter of dollars, it's a matter of timing, that may provide enough of, of an argument for the employer uh, to say this threatens viability. It's not, it's not income statement viability, because you have a receivable from the government, right? Or balance sheet uh, viability. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's instead a cash flow viability that my payroll vendor said, there's no way they're going to have this online for another six months. And I got to provide upwards of 12 weeks. That's, you know, two plus 10, right? Uh, upwards of, of 12 weeks of paid leave, uh, be it full or partial, kind of doesn't matter if you can't, if you don't have the cash flow to do it. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are some examples of arguments they could make. Are they going to be successful? I, I don't know. We won't know until there's you know, regulations on it. And even when we get regulations, we're not really going to know what they mean until there's been some sort of guidance or enforcement activity on it. Uh, so, this is definitely one of those situations where folks are just going to have to, you know, do what they think is best for their business and for their employees, balancing those concerns. And, you know, the end result will be what it is. Um, and, you know, the business owner has to just be comfortable with, with the decision that he or she makes. Um, 
which is probably not what you wanted to hear, but that's, that's my answer. Thank you. You're very welcome. Did I, did I answer your question uh, fully, hopefully, if not satisfactorily? Yes, you did. And I think it's an interesting um, way to think about it because the tax credit doesn't show up at the same time that you pay your employees that money. So that could be um, very difficult for employers, especially those in the, in the service industry um, where they have nothing coming in. Yep. It makes a lot of sense to me. and I think it's a, a great point. So thank you. No problem. Yeah. Uh, so run those cash flow statements um, yeah. and, and get that bar chart uh, that shows the uh, the month to month net change in cash flow. Uh, that'll be very, very visual and telling because the, the chart will go like this. Right. Uh, in terms of cash flow. And, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, it'll be bureaucrats who are making these decisions and, and potentially judges, but probably bureaucrats. Uh, and uh, uh, so it, it'll be very, it's, it's a visual representation. So I, I hope you're able to carry that to your clients and, and, uh, um, you know, thank you, by the way, for all of you who are advising clients right now, it's, it's a, it's a tough spot to be in and, uh, my heart goes out to you. Uh, so thank you everybody for attending, uh, for your participation. If you have questions after, uh, you can go to help.rsfire.com and pop them into the messenger, uh, you know, we, like, like we mentioned on the, on the front end, as Kendra said, this is a weekly webinar uh, and weekly town hall. So uh, do, do come back next week. We want this to be collaborative. If in the meantime, you've learned that something we talked about uh, is, is a little different, uh, share it with your colleagues. Uh, this is the, what we're hoping to mutually, for, for everyone here to collaborate together and uh, you know, to help best serve employers and our employees. Uh, so again, thank you very much uh, for your time uh, and uh, we look forward to chatting more with you. Thanks a lot. Take care, everybody.